you live in LA. I live in Los Angeles. Yes, which yeah. is very fabulous. Yes, and the weather there is always 70 degrees, and sometimes it catches on fire, but that's okay. <laughs> because I can wear shorts. That's just, that's the risk you have to take living there. But thank you for flying out to New York so we could talk about your book, which... Thank you for doing this, Phoebe Robinson. Okay. It's Phoebe <laughs> Robinson of Tube Dope Queens, Stop everybody. It! Stop it! Okay, I do want to say that, so I'm happy that I, so we share the same lit agent, Robert. Yes. And I literally, when he told me that you, he was working on your book, I was like, I want to moderate his book. To, I was like, I don't even know if that's okay for me to just, I'm very <laughs> pushy about what I want, but I was like, I love him. He's amazing. Can I moderate it? Ask him. And then he was like, he asked you, you said That's yes. delightful because I never would have asked you because I, I would have imagined that you had a lot of things going on because you have a lot of things going on. I do, but I love reading books. It's like my favorite thing. And I love essay collections by very smart and funny people. People. So this is like totally my jam. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to start. I don't remember how long we've known each other. We met at like a comedy show, like doing stand up. I, I think believe. we met at like Bridgetown 2012. Oh, in Portland. Yes. Yeah, Voodoo Donuts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, but, um, I've always just thought you were like so talented and so funny. You have the best laugh. And so one of my favorite things about this book, like when I was finished with it, my life as a goddess, um, I was like, I've actually never read a book like this before. Like I just haven't. And it was just like really weird. Cause that's like so rare to feel that way. Cause normally you read a book and you're like, Oh, it's very funny, amusing blah, 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 whatever. But I was like this specific point of view of like just never heard of before. And so I just kind of wonder if you could sort of just kind of inform everybody like what was your process and like what do you want people to take away from the book and then we can sort of get into it because I made notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I went into the book assuming that I would write that collection of humorous stories from your childhood that every comedian writes. <laughs> and so I wrote like a book proposal for that and uh, it like went out and uh, like there was one editor who was like super enthusiastic about it and then there was this other editor and she was like, that is not the book you should write. I have listened to your podcast about pop culture. You should write a book where you talk about pop culture. She was like, if you write a book that doesn't include why you love Ruth Bader Ginsburg in Canada, you have done it wrong. <laughs> and it was like, a very, like I was writing on the Mindy Project and we were shooting the pilot for Talk Show The Game Show and I was very busy, but still over the course of the weekend, I wrote a new book proposal and we sent that out and that lady said, I don't want to work on this book. Or her boss wouldn't let her. Oh um, but then that nice man who had been so enthusiastic about my other book was like, we can do this. Uh, and then I worked with him, the lovely Rakesh Satyal, um, and Ooh. we made ourselves a book together. Yes! Um, and the thing I want people to take away from the book is just like, I kind of, as I was writing these things, I, I, like I, I didn't really put it together until I was done and I probably should have done this at some point in time before that. But the book like all together is really about like, when you grow up in a world that doesn't tell stories about people like you, how do you figure out how to tell your own story? Um, and I think that different people encounter that in different ways and this is just sort of like, a little chart of how I figured that out. Yeah. Um, and one of the things I love about it is you talk, you know, you write a lot about internalization, which I think everyone kind of does, and sort of just sort of maybe the negative feelings that you carry about yourself that you don't even realize you have. And so I'm wondering, like, through the process of writing this book, was there anything that you learned about yourself that you still were like, oh, wow, I didn't know that's how I felt about myself, but writing this book has sort of like ha made me deal with it and sort of move past it or? It's interesting because I think there are ways that we can like congratulate ourselves for judging ourselves in the way that the world would, you know? Mm -hmm. When it's like, oh yes, I am telling myself that I'm a terrible lazy person or whatever. Um, or like I, I, I am congratulating myself for not being super gay in that way that I would kind of like to be super gay, but no, I shouldn't be super gay. And you know, that's within you. But I would say the most significant like internalization of homophobia I have, because you can like convince yourself that you're all like cool and comfortable with yourself and you've figured it all out. Um, I am not great at slow dancing with another man. And <laughs> that didn't come up in the course of writing the book, but I yeah. would say it is just sort of that one thing of like, yes, I still hate myself in a thousand different ways. Mm. Um, you know, we'll see what we can do before I die. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, so I has anyone read the book yet or started it yet? It is um it is very smart. <laughs> like there are a lot of references and footnotes where I was like, Oh, I don't know that. Oh, I don't know that. <laughs> Oh shit, Google! I don't know that either. Um, and so I, I really like your your brand of humor because it's it is uh, like that perfect mix of like highbrow and lowbrow, and I think that comes a lot from you growing up where you did in California, where there was just like not a lot else to do other than absorb a lot of content. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, is like uh, I grew up in a place where most people weren't that educated and were doing working class jobs. So I am now thrilled and delighted to be surrounded with people who are like are thoughtful and smart and know things that I don't know and all of that. And so I will. I wanted this book to feel like I had had two and a half drinks in me. And we were at a party, and I had cornered you to talk about something, <laughs> um, which is an experience with, that you have had, Phoebe. Yeah. Um, and like in those situations, there are a lot of asides and digressions um, that feel a lot like footnotes. And I like uh, I, w I was actually um, bef like before I wrote the book, um, the two books people said like I, I should read to think about were um, Bad Feminist and Chuck Klosterman's. Uh, Sex, Drugs, and Cocoa Puffs. And mm -hmm. in the chapter in Bad Feminist where she talks about um, uh, crossword puzzles, Roxane Gay has a ton of footnotes, and I saw that, and I was like, I'm going to do that. So yeah. yet another story <laughs> of a white gay man appropriating a, a black woman's <laughs> culture, <laughs> and I would just like to apologize. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering how you feel about your hometown now, because reading it, it and I, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, which is... There are rural parts, but it's still, I guess, some people call it like a B city. It's certainly like not New York or L.A. But the, I do also sort of have moments where I'm like, like I'll, I'll be at home in Cleveland. I'll be like, this is just such a sad place. And I, and I feel bad thinking that because I'm like, it's very judgy because I'm coming as like, I've been in New York for 17 years now. So I'm like, I'm a New Yorker, honey. And I'm like... <laughs> I'm definitely like, oh, Cleveland is just kind of like a bummer. And so I always want to like check myself to be like, I don't want to feel like I'm judging like where I came from. But like, I know you have like a lot of feelings about your hometown. So like, how do you reconcile that and not feel like, oh, LA is so much better than where I'm from. And like, this place is like a dumpster fire. <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't write that fair, in the book. To be he fair, did not write dumpster fire in the book. That the, was my interpretation. <laughs> the small range of mountains close to my home are currently on fire. Um, <laughs> so it is close enough. But like, it's hard. I come from a tiny little farm town that is like an hour north of Sacramento, which is a part of California that none of you have ever remotely thought of. Though, if you have had a prune or a peach in your life, that is probably where it came from. Fuck Georgia. They talk a big game. <laughs> but they produce fewer peaches than my hometown. Uh, and the thing is, like, it's hard because when I go back there now, I just have to turn me off. You know, like, there's just not really, like, I turn into a closeted 12-year-old again because what else would I do? Um, and it's hard because I do love that place. It's the place that made me. Um, I just don't know, like, how to how to reconcile those two things. Um, I already, <laughs> I have three Amazon reviews, and one of them is from a dude in my hometown who is not pleased. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> well, I think you really just kind of like, you like came out of there, and you're like kicking ass. So. You're amazing. Um, I want to talk about one of my favorite essays in the book called Shoulder to Hip. Um, and there's so much that I, I love in this essay. Um, I want to talk about a few things. You bring up Kate and you say, Kate, the, fast sister, the fat sister on NBC's This Is Us. Um, and you say that she has no qualities. She's 37 years old and is wholly devoid of skills or passions other than kind of liking singing, which I... And I am obsessed with the show. It's like my cry porn. Like whenever I want to just like release, I turn it on. But it did always bother me. Now, you know, I, I obviously was coming from places like I'm a female performer too. And like it's, there's, it's so hard for female characters to be multidimensional in the show. And I really noticed that her character was just kind of like, I got to lose weight. And I'm like, 
I, I have friends who are plus size and that is, they are not obsessed about their weight and they have like amazing sex lives and they have great jobs and that's just like not seen. Well, I mean, and like the most important thing is that Chrissy Metz is a great actress and she's yeah. getting work and having different kinds of people on television pay, like pave the way. Like we have Dietland now and if you haven't watched Dietland on AMC, mm -hmm. it's really good. Um, but... There's, she's 37 and she's essentially done nothing. Like these writers, and they're talented, capable writers, but they kind of can't imagine um, this fat person as having lived a life that would have been valuable in any way because she wasn't spending all of her time just trying to unfat herself. And I just go back to, she has no gay karaoke friends. <laughs> like, she really likes singing. And there, there's not one gay guy who's like, bitch, ignore them all. Live your life. Yeah. <laughs> I want to read my one of my favorite um, uh, lines in this essay. Um, it's, our narratives about conquering fatness aren't about saving fat people. It's about letting thin people feel like they are already saved, members of the chosen people. We fat people are bound to live our lives tied to the struggle. Until we're done being fat, the trying has to be all of who we are. And I was like, damn. I just like never really thought about it. And you just like boiled it down so smartly and intelligently. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering as like a writer and a performer in Hollywood, which is, you know, I'm already like, I got to start dyeing my gray hair because I'm feeling... I, I remember when I was like 27 and I was doing stand up and this guy who like ran this club was like, oh, you should start telling people you're like 23. He was already like, you're too old and like, I need to be like younger. And so I'm wondering like how you're feeling about Hollywood at this point in time. Like there's, there are shows like Diet Land, but like, how are you feeling I mean, in general? The thing is, is that first of all, I'm a man, so it is always easier and better to be fat. And also, there are ways that being in entertainment, it is easier for me because they do need comic relief fat people. Uh, to, or, or sometimes, you know, it's like if you see a gay guy in something, he's either got to be the hottest human being ever or in some way solidly reminding you how asexual he is. And I can totally satisfy that role and have. <laughs> Uh, it's how I became a member of SAG. And <laughs> I'm fine with that. It, like, um, it is more just that like, these, these people are never being represented as protagonists. You know, like, it, it is um, an interesting problem of... Uh, the wonderful thing about diversity is that it's, div in its way, diversity for everyone. We have these expectations of who is central to the story and who is not central to the story. And I think that there are really cool moments when changing who is at the center of the story changes who gets to be at the periphery. One of the things I always loved about girls is that in making Lena Dunham the center of the story, Marnie got to be a fuck up and a mess, where before she always would have had to have been uh, Mary Tyler Moore, you know? Mm -hmm. Like it lets every Everybody have different kinds of perspectives. And so, uh, you know, I'm excited about Lindy West's new series, Shrill, with A.D. Bryant. Yeah. It's exciting. Uh, and I, the thing that bothers me most, back to your first question of, like, what's still in your head, um, is that when I went to write a book, it was hard for me to write a book where I wasn't the funny person next to somebody else who was moving things along. You know, it yeah. was hard for me to see my own life not as this person just commenting. And most of the book is me just commenting. Yeah. <laughs> so would you say that now you f you view yourself as like sort of like the hero of your own stories now? Or are you still kind of sort of wrestling with that? I am the hero of the story of the story of being able to see myself as the hero of the story. <laughs> it is not completed yet, but I believe I'm consulting the Oracle right now. <laughs> You're too funny. I love this. This is so great. I'm glad I showered for this. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so I, I want to stay on uh, fatness for a second because, um, you know, it's not something that I'm, you know, fully familiar with. And I think writing from this perspective, like you just, I just think it's so great and just made me think about so many things that I take for granted. Um, about my own life. And so what are just like some, like what's like maybe the biggest misconception about fatness that you wish would just go away like right now? Um, 
I think anyone going through the world thinking that another person's fatness is something that they're doing to you is something that you maybe need to move past. Like, um, I have been various weights at various points in time, and there are definitely points in time when I know that me getting on an airplane might involve somebody being very, very offended that their arm is touching mine for a period of time. And it's like, is this helpful? Are you, is it really that bad? Um, and I just think being aware of all of the jokes and stories that we've been told in media about who this person is just because they're fat. Like, are they sad? Are they dumb? Maybe, but maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, um, I want to move to, you mentioned earlier where you were talking about internalized homophobia. Oh, can I say one more thing that people should think of about, course, about fatness? Of course, it's your night. Go for Fat it. Fat people are statistically proven to be half as likely as the rest of the population to commit suicide. Because we are handling our shit in our own way, okay? Oh my so gosh. So calm the fuck down and <laughs> stop judging. <laughs> And that's what it is. It's really just a way for people to find some sort of avenue that they can feel like they're better than other people. That's really what it is. It's such a tempting way of feeling. It yeah. feels good to be like, ah, oh, yeah, I got it figured out. Yeah. But it's also like I know that there was some video. I, I'm trying to act like I don't follow the Kardashians. So I'm like, there was some video, I think, but I know. <laughs> but... <laughs> But there was a video out where Kendall was like talking to Kim and she was like, oh my God, you look so skinny. She's like, yeah, I'm only like 119. And it was just very much seeing that where I was like, that's actually gross to be like, you're so skinny. You're like so thin and tiny. Like, isn't this like amazing? And I just feel like, well, no, it's not amazing. It's like not an achievement. Yeah, you know? I mean, look, I'm I'm proud for people being able to do any of the things that they want to do. Yeah. Uh, those girls have done so much important work for all of us. <laughs> um, uh, I just think that, like, stepping into someone's life and saying, all right, shut everything down, buddy. You need to stop your body from doing the thing that it's been doing for your entire life is not helpful, you know? Yeah. Also, poor Chloe. Um <laughs> She's so gorgeous, she's so thin, but she's just always going to be bigger than the rest of them, and we as a culture just like torture her for it, and she's fucking gorgeous. Yeah, and she got so much work done because we were like, oh, you're like the gross one, and it's like, she was fine. She was totally fine. One time, I got yes. to be around a table with her, Chelsea Handler, um, and like a couple of, oh, Leah Remini. Oh, fun. Um, yes. And they were all just discussing what procedures were being had now, like what women were doing. And I was just like, take mental notes, take mental <laughs> notes. Because in Los Angeles, it's very important to know what's being done right now. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, so what is being done right now? Oh, this was years ago, but okay. it was like, instead of microwaving fat, we were freezing fat, I believe. Mm. And we were discussing that. Okay. I, I'm glad you brought up Chelsea Handler because you write about, and I love that you did this in the book, you write about like all the cool fucking jobs that you had, which I think is great because I think a lot of times, especially when you're success, successful and there's so many people like trying to make it, you might sort of like try and dim the light or like make yourself be like, oh, I haven't like accomplished as much, even though you clearly have. And so what made you want to be like, I'm going to just like take a time out and celebrate myself for writing on these awesome shows and having a great career? Um, three things. First of all, uh, our, our friend Matt Rogers, who does the wonderful Lost Culturistas podcast, I like was like, hey, what would you want to be in my book? I'm writing a book. And he's like, I don't give a shit about you coming out. I want to know about what it's like walking into that room knowing you have to write for like some fancy lady of comedy. And I was like, okay. Second thing is, people are always like, why did you leave Chelsea lately? And I thought I owed them a semi-juicy version of why I left Chelsea lately. Uh, and the third one was just that um, gay men in entertainment are so frequently, like, as writers, as performers, on some end of ventriloquism. Like, most of the writing jobs that I do are me writing for a lady. Um, and, you know, gay performers are so frequently speaking words written for them by, like, a, a straight writer. So I just wanted to talk about like that kind of experience of, of seeing, seeing my own voice and my own sort of like participation through these wonderful ladies who I got to write for. Also, I watched the Golden Globes at Joan Rivers' home while she was wearing a house dress. I'm gonna tell you guys about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, that, that's amazing. 
So I, when I read that, I was like, oh my God, he's made it. That's like so cool. So can you kind of like tell us a little bit, like give us like a sneak peek, because I don't want to ruin it for everyone who hasn't read it yet, but can you tell us a little bit about the Joan Rivers experience? Okay. It was a low point in my career. <laughs> Things were not going well. How well were they not going? I was writing for Punked. Um, and I, it was the worst, because like you're not writing jokes at all. I don't like pranks. They are for boys. Boys like pranks. Girls and gay guys like saying mean things about your friends while they're not there. <laughs> um, and so... I was working on punks, and like uh, a, guy, a comic I knew, uh, a gay comic who's the head writer of Fashion Police, just DM'd me and was like, hey, can you, we need you to write for Fashion Police. Can you write for Fashion Police? Sure. And then he's like, you're coming to Joan Rivers' house uh, for the Golden Globes. And I was like, what? <laughs> it was everything I had wanted as a 10-year-old boy. Uh, and I got there late, of course, because I'm not a responsible person. And I walked in, and she like said hello and I sat down and there were like seven of us there and it was uh, uh, like the other new writer was uh, the great drag queen Jackie Beats who if in any other situation I would have been like oh my god it's Jackie Beats <laughs> but because Joan and Melissa in a tennis dress were there um, uh, <laughs> like it, it was ridiculous and then she was like do you want something to eat and there was this, like huge buffet of deli and I was like I'll wait for everyone else and she was like no all of this is just for the seven people here and I was like yes Jewish mothers are always the same <laughs> um, but the most important part of this story is that um, Melissa Rivers son Cooper was sitting next to Joan Rivers and we like someone came on on screen and we all assumed it was Emma Stone and he said uh, no uh, <laughs> That's uh, Jane Levy from Suburgatory. <laughs> and I was like, this is what happens when you get raised by E! Entertainment Television. <laughs> he was like, an, like a sporty eight-year-old boy <laughs> who could parse between Hollywood's young redheads. And I was <laughs> floored. Um, so I I really enjoyed the the story about um, Chelsea lately and you leaving, um, because what I I really liked the story because you sort of reached a point where you love working the show like she was an awesome boss she had a great time but like you wanted I don't even want to say like more for yourself you just wanted something different where it was something where it, could be like your voice coming through and not writing for someone else. And I know for a lot of people, it's hard to like make that leap in whatever industry it is to be like, I'm gonna kind of go for the thing that I really want rather than the thing that's like safe and what I know. Um, so where have you, have you always sort of had that ability to be like, I'm just gonna be able to go for it or? Not remotely. Um, and it's, it's hard because on the one hand, like I always love to tell the story of how I didn't choose to move to Los Angeles. I got a job that forced me to move there, which is stupid. Everyone who comes to LA wanting to work in entertainment is making a choice. And I think that there's as much temptation to be like, oh no, I, I know I can't do that, as being one of the people who's like, yes, I can do that. Um, so I, I would say I'm, uh, I do a bad job of believing in myself, while at the same time being arrogant enough to get the job done, kind of. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the thing is, is you can read all about the very complex story of me leaving Chelsea lately in the book, uh, but it was as much as anything me like um, failing my way out of a job that... I no longer felt comfortable in. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you have written for a lot of female voices, um, which I you have such a great knack for. Mini Project is like one of my favorite shows of all time. Thank you very much. So thank you for working on that show. Um, so what do you like writing? What do you like about writing for a female voice? And what's something that you feel like could be added to the, the landscape of? I mean, the thing is, I'm never going to say that I'm great at it because mm -hmm. I'm not a woman. And there is this way that like, um, you know, sort of like the, 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 the resting perception of Hollywood is that gays should write for women because there's never going to be any story about a gay. Uh, and also women can't write. And it's like, well, there are a number of problems in what you're doing there. When I, um, when I got hired on Punked, I was specifically told that I was the woman writer. Um, what? And I, I know, it was terrible. 
Um, oh my God. I Who said that to you? Was it Ashton? It was not Ashton. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think that they're like most men uh, like assume that they understand women's perspective. And I think the best first step in trying to write for somebody unlike yourself is understanding you don't necessarily understand their perspective and have to take a step back and just think a little bit harder. I think too frequently when gay characters are on television or in movies, people didn't, st like when written by like straight writers, people didn't step back and say, hey, wait, let's think three times about this. Um, and I had a good example. And oh, yeah, I wrote for the MTV show Awkward. Uh, and I sat around a table yes. with like, there were like six or seven other writers, only one other was a man. And like everybody else had been a 16 year old girl and knew what they were scared about when they were a 16 year old girl and understood intimately how a 16 year old girl it, like understands her body and stuff like that. And I didn't. And so I, I just had to try my hardest to think and also listen because there were other people there who were more informed and being able to do that was really important. And the, the beautiful guiding force on the Mindy Project is it was the rare situation where you had a woman of color who was just in charge. Like who if you pitch something and it wasn't right, she would just be like, that's not how it works. And she wouldn't make you feel bad about it, but she just had her vision and I tried to help make her as funny and wonderful as possible. But at the end of the day, the person making the decision was a funny, wonderful woman of color. So it was a good show. Will, will there ever be sort of a Guy Branham half hour narrative show? Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I, I tend to, for many of the reasons stated in the book, tend to not write about myself. Um, because, you know, I've spent my life thinking about what it would be like to be other people, mm -hmm. you know? Like, that's m far more liberating than writing a show that's about you. Um, but yes, I have, I have broken one but not written it. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you think you'll ever get to a place where you'll feel comfortable, like, writing about yourself? Even if it's, like, a fictionalized version, like, you don't have to, like, you know. Um, I, I don't know. I think it's, mm -hmm. I'm really impressed by those people who are able to take a fictionalized version of themselves and uh, treat it as a character. Mm. You know, that's really hard to say, you know, because um, like on the show, Mindy Lahiri was not Mindy Kaling. She was uh, frivolous and silly and, and all of those things. And being able to shape that character and love her, but be able to say, this is not me, uh, was really impressive. So I, I hope so. I adore you so much. I, just I adore you that. so much. Um, thanks. Uh, um, so you have a talk show out. Yes, I do. And I did it before. You were pretty good on it. Oh, thank you. I was nervous. <laughs> I, I just I always get stressed in those situations. Well, Phoebe was yeah. very nice. Um, my talk show is called Ta Talk Show the Game Show, and it's on True TV. And we have this like rule where I can be kicked out of the game, and then we get an emergency guest ho uh, guest host. And when we did it as a live show, it was always just a very improvisational thing. But we got an opportunity to have the Ricky Lake as uh, an emergency guest host, and then we had to be to like a guest who was a friend of the show. Hey, could we maybe have? Ricky Lake come out while you are on the the couch and Phoebe was like Ricky Lake fuck yeah yeah um, of course uh, so you you helped us out with that which I very much appreciate I it. it I didn't realize she was so short you know she's tiny she's she's like maybe five feet yes it was nuts it was very exciting and yeah. then after when the show was over she was like do you want me to do the Madison with you which is the yes the dance <laughs> from Hairspray and I was like absolutely yes. Um, and uh, Marissa Jarrett Winoker uh, did an ad for my book, and I now realize, like, I just want to be friends with the entire Tracy Turnblad community. <laughs> um, so if any of you know Nikki Blonsky. <laughs> um, I, I, let me just check how we're doing on time, because I want to get, okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. Maybe one more. I'll have one more question. Okay. And then we'll open up to Q and A's from the audience. Okay. Um, okay. Let me see. If I underline so much. I really like books where I can do that. Um, oh, can I have you read something? Sure. Okay. No, there's, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I'm better at this. I swear. Oh, well, maybe not. Um, Someone's phone is on, yes. Um, 
Oh my gosh. Okay, can I have you read this part? I really, these two paragraphs is a lot, but I oh, really okay. loved it and it moved me so much. Okay. Um, this is uh, from um, the thing that was in the New York Times. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks, um, Rach. <laughs> Uh, this is why I hate my voice and the voices of other gay men. Heterosexual society wants to keep us uh, weak, apart, and uneducated, so it strips us of the tools we need to find each other and learn from each other. I didn't come out of the closet at 17. I didn't even admit, myself th uh, admit to myself that I was gay. I heard a real gay voice, though, Armistead Moppins, that was skilled enough and brave enough to show me a real life, a whole life that could be mine. And, of course, with enough murder, mysteries, and drugs to seem appealing to a young closeted person. I was talking about watching the PBS series of uh, Tales of the City. And that's why I love my voice and the voices of other gay men. They are full of beauty, culture, cooperation, music, opinions about Alfre Woodard, and sex. <laughs> Paul Rudnick's Jeffrey, Tony Kushner's Angels in America, uh, Terrell Alvin McCraney's Moonlight. I added Arzamora Lindmark's uh, Rolling the R's after the Uncorrected Galleys because I was like, Branham, have some respect. <laughs> um, and all the way back to Forster's Morris. These aren't just works from an underrepresented community. They're people who were trained to hide and be silent, but were resolute enough to make noise despite the danger. They didn't know me, but they did it for me. Yes. And I feel like your voice is so necessary. It's so needed. And I think so many people, no matter what their background is, no matter what they look like, they're going to read this book and they're going to be changed. And they're going to think better and more clearly. So thank you. That's very, very sweet. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, okay, so we have about 20 minutes, I think, for audience Q&A. So um, I guess just yell it out. Oh, there's a mic. Okay, great. Are you from Ohio? Oh, where? Oh, I've never been there. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we'll just open up so you guys can ask Guy cool. whatever you want, and uh, okay. And say your name, too. Hi, uh, my name is Julia. I'm a huge Pop Rocket fan. Oh, thank you. Um, and um, I would love to hear about the origins of like the concept for this podcast. Um, as both a recovering academic and current person who works in media, it, it strikes a really perfect tone for me. Oh, thank you. Um, so I'd love to hear about how you decided to come up with the concept and also curate the panel with people who do very different things. So uh, Pop Rocket, which is uh, talking about, is the podcast that I do weekly. Um, it is a pop culture roundtable um, with me and Karen Tongson, who is an academic at USC. We all love Karen. Yes, um, yes, love Karen. Margaret Wappler, who is a journalist, and Winter Mitchell, who is a digital strategist. And it basically just comes down to Jesse Thorne, who is the president of the, or who the head of the podcast network. He stole an idea from NPR. <laughs> NPR had Pop Culture Happy Hour, which is a roundtable. Yeah. Uh, and he was just basically, what if they did, what if we did a pop culture roundtable and there weren't any straight, cis, white guys on it? Yes. What if, what if we did That's a That's the best part of it. Yes. <laughs> um, and so, like, he just, uh, you know, he, he sort of came to me first because he had heard me, like, spouting on about something. And he was like, well, let's figure this out. Um, and then we, you know, through suggestions and recommendations, we put together a panel, we like tried it out for a while, switched things around, um, and we sort of found the right panel, and then uh, Oliver was one of the guys who was on it who knew too much about music, and <laughs> he left to go lead his life, and we got Karen, who is really, it's a, the wonderful thing about the show is that like, Karen is like, the whole show just in one person. <laughs> She's like uh, a, a queer, non-gender conforming lesbian uh, who teaches at USC and is an expert on karaoke. Um, <laughs> and there's just never a question that I can't go to Karen with. Like uh, the, the chapter about gay voices, like, I sent that, I know that oh, she's very okay. busy, but I sent yeah. it to Karen, and I was like, what should I do differently? And she was like, you should mention flouncy ponytails um, for lesbians. <laughs> there was fl flouncy ponytails and um, like eyebrow rings as ways that lesbians flag themselves to the world. Um, and I was like, yeah, I will do that. Um, Thank you. Does anyone else have a Thank question? Thank you, Julia. Oh, up here. Thanks. Um, my name is Joe. I actually also wanted to ask you about Pop Rocket, which I love. Um, 
And uh, as the last person said, like, um, you have like academics on that show, and something that like I've sort of loved about your work since I first encountered it is that you are not afraid to like intellectualize things. Um, and you know, I'm an academic, and when I'm talking to non-academics, I sometimes feel like a little ashamed to like into over-intellectualize things. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And especially if you're talking about pop culture, it's easy to sort of be accused of like, oh, you're thinking too hard about that, or you're like reading too much into it. Can you just say more about like? Um, kind of being an intellectual and intellectualizing pop culture and all the other things that you love? Because it, it's like one of the things that makes your work a real pleasure for me. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, one of the things like, it's weird when you finish a book because there are so many things that you should have done. And one of the things that like, I didn't even think about until the, the piece came out about gay voices in the New York Times is that like, Karen's wife is an expert on the idea of gay voices and ventriloquism. And like that I didn't ask her just to like read it over or have thoughts. Um, was <laughs> dumb. But um, the thing is, is I think that growing up in a place where essentially no adult I knew had gone to college, except for the ones who were teaching school, um, I didn't really learn to know my place when it came to stuff like that. And like, I liked college. <laughs> Should I get that? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Melissa, what's going on? <laughs> hey, I was just talking to Joe. Who were you calling for? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> hey, um, hey, Melissa, yeah. <laughs> what's up? <laughs> this is Guy. Are we going to drinks after this? <laughs> <laughs> You're talking to Guy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give the phone back because we're both upset by this, <laughs> but we'll make it through. Sorry about that. <laughs> but it, it basically just comes down to, um, like I never stopped, like part of me, uh, a, a part of me will always want, like after a movie, be like, what paper would I write about that? I saw Head Over Heels last night. I have some thoughts. Um, <laughs> But I just, you know, I've always loved trying to, to put things together in my head. And I, I do understand that I do not have the discipline to be an academic. And I respect so much the work that you guys have to do. And there is something so ridiculously nice about being able to fuck around in that world without having to take it seriously. Karen always treats me like a big boy who is eating at the table. And I, like, really enjoy that and respect that. Um, but I don't for a moment pretend that uh, I could fuck with your business. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Hi, uh, my name's Rachel. Um, I just had a question about Talk Show the Game Show. Um, sure. Which I adore. Um, if you could have like your dream guest, living or dead, who would it be? Okay, Rachel, let's just begin with Talk Show the Game Show is not about a single guest. It is about a panel, okay? <laughs> it is about people... Then dream panel, I should say, It is say, about yeah. people breezily interacting. Um, I am going to say best talk show guests of all time. We're going to open with Oscar Wilde, because you assume. <laughs> um, uh, then we're going to go, like... Um, I'm going to say, like... Like Cleopatra in between Caesar and Mark Antony <laughs> when she's a woman possessed of her skills. Uh, and then Julia Louis Dreyfus because she always brings it home. <laughs> Thank you. What are your thoughts of Head, head Over Heels? Oh. <laughs> Uh, Head Over Heels is really, really, really good. Like, it's, uh, f do you guys all know what it is? It, like, it's the Go-Go's musical, but um, uh, the guy, uh, Jeff Witte, who did the book for, uh, bo uh, for Avenue Q, like, took Philip Sidney's uh, Arcadia, or something about Arcadia, like, this uh, Elizabethan prose poem and turned it into a weird story about gender. I would say more than gender or transness, it is about femininity and about like centering femininity. Um, and it's like a delightful play. There are go-go songs, which are very good. Um, and I wept repeatedly 
uh, there's Frosé as an option while you're there. <laughs> like, they know exactly. It was like this beautiful mix of like, um, you know, women and gay guys in their like 50s and late 40s who like loved the Go-Go's when they happened and like younger people who were just excited that Peppermint was in something. Um, <laughs> it was like such a beautiful experience. And then I was like, well, I should read this Ben Brantley review that uh, people have been talking about. And I, I just don't know that we saw the same play. But I think, but it really is a thing of the way the stories we tell enforce the stories we tell. Because like, the male lead is not somebody who is built like a male lead is supposed to, um, supposed to be. Uh, like he really wanted to, you know, point out the fact that they had cast a fat girl as the pretty one. And it's a play that never thinks it's a joke that the fat girl is the pretty one. And I'm probably gonna like that play. I wanna see it. Sounds like an endorsement. Yeah. It was so good. <laughs> Okay, not an academic, but from Cleveland. But oh, nice. what I want to know, you're like great on Twitter. I like following you on Twitter. And it can be a terrible place. <laughs> and how do you like stay normal and happy on Twitter? And how, like, do you not clap back? Do you like see bad things and shy away? Like, I, I feel like there's authors that clap back a lot or famous people. And that your Twitter always seems to be like funny and nice. And is that something that you have to fight for? Or do you just try to be yourself? Um, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I mean, I used to every once in a while clap back, but now I'm just like, I just can't be bothered. So now either, like if there's some like dumb Trump thing, I'll like comment on it. But usually I'm just like, oh, come see this thing I'm doing. Or like, oh, this mm. article was really good. Or like, oh my God, isn't Sandra O oh amazing? And that's just like, <laughs> let's bow down to her. But I, I try to like keep it not about like. I mean, the yeah. only things we should be talking about right now are supporting like the Mueller investigation and Sandra O. Oh. Right? Like, <laughs> it should be our focuses <laughs> as a people. If you have not seen her early Canadian movies, Double Happiness is so good. Um, but... Like, be, like, treating people on the internet as non-people is very, very easy. Um, but I also, but, so I try to not do that. I'm not great at it, none of us are. But I think more than that, it's just where I started out was as a powerless person who was angry at the media for having power. I was coming from a place of like, oh, fuck them. Like, their stories get to be told, but mine don't. But now I am not in that place. So I understand that feeling of alienation and anger at the people who are on TV and wanting to hear your voice like just in the cacophony. I think it's cool that Twitter is democratizing. I think it is cool that Twitter lets random people tell famous people what they think. Um, we could all be more mature about it, but also like I've criti as I say in the book, I have criticized enough people. I look forward to you guys criticizing me. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah, and I block a lot too. <laughs> That's like, I block so much. Like anytime someone like says anything about me being in an interracial relationship, I'm like never need to hear from you again. I, great. I yeah. used to be very much like, it is my obligation to hear, uh, to at least hear their discourse. And I have now come to a point where I'm like, nothing, there is nothing to be gotten from this. Yeah. Let's just quiet this down. Yeah. Especially when you go and it is just sort of like 15 followers and it's yeah. like, this is probably just someone's pretend account for starting fights. Yeah, exactly. Any other questions? Oh. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kyrie. Whoop. Hello, Kyrie. How's it going? We are former well. co-workers. She is a plant, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I know this one. Yeah, your announcement on Facebook planted me here. <laughs> just <letting> you know. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Thank you um, for coming back to New York. You were missed. You're here. <laughs> uh, so my question is, I was wondering what advice you had for someone who is an aspiring comedy writer who finds that most of their writing exists in their Google Drive. Well, I mean... It's one of the reasons I started stand-up was because I knew that it, 
I wouldn't really be able to just write a novel or a screenplay and like believe in myself the whole time that it would like screw with my head. So I think it is being brave enough to show to expose your stuff to other people, whether it's having people read stuff or doing stand up. Like I think when it uh, particularly when it comes to comedy, I think performing in front of audiences is kind of necessary. Like I've known um, like uh, Kyrie, is Kyrie, I'm always, yes, I'm always pronouncing it wrong. I know that it means something beautiful in Greek. What does it mean in Greek? You're outing me, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Kyrie eleison means Lord have mercy. It's from an 80s song. My middle name is eleison. <laughs> yes! That's lovely. So I do comedy to cope. <laughs> <laughs> but like, um, I know a lot of people who have sort of like, worked their way up through TV shows and then get their chance as a writer. And the business of being able to make jokes is hard for them because that hasn't been a thing that they've been training. So I think regardless of what you're doing, like if you want it to be comedy, stand up or improv are things you should be doing. And I know you're probably like, but guy, I'm not a performer. Fuck that. Like you have to, you have to figure out how an audience will react so that it just can come from your gut. Like when you're like, when you're nine people around a table and six of them are white guys who went to the Harvard, like went to Harvard and were on the lampoon, you have to be the person in that room who's like, no, but human beings won't laugh at that <laughs> and fix the joke and uh, stand up ups with that. Yeah, I agree. Stand up is because you've been doing it for how long? I'm 10 years in. I'm very old. I've been doing it for 14 years. Yes. Actually, no, 16. Wouldn't it be nicer if I could have just sliced <laughs> off those two years? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but your voice is so, like, even, like, your writing voice, like, I'm just, like, I can hear you saying it. Oh, it's it's very just sweet. so Thank you. Yeah, it's so perfect. So. Thanks. Yeah. Any more questions? I think we have time for, hold on. We have time for two more questions. There's that dude back. Oh, yeah. It's tank top season. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Um, I wanted to ask you what it's like to be a fan Wait, of. Wait, what's your name? Oh, hi. I'm Sam. Cool. Um, I wanted to ask you what it's like to be a fan of the pop culture entity that is Canada. <laughs> oh. Uh, the thing that I enjoy most in having done press for this book over the course of the past couple of days is that the thing that is universally said is I cannot believe they let you have a chapter entirely about Canada. Um, I myself am a little bit like, why did you do that? <laughs> um, but like... At the end of the day, it's just about the fact that there are 30 million human beings who speak the same language as us, who are next to us, not that far away, and we do not think about them at all. And I think, <laughs> and we think it's a hilarious joke and, and dismiss it, but I do think that anytime you are just dismissing somebody, you have to think about why. And I, I think that like, there is a lot to be learned from like who they are and what, the, what they've been doing that we're just ignoring. Like uh, in the book I talk about, it all goes back to I was in the M Encyclopedia and there was a state entry for a state that did not exist. And I went to my mom and I was like, what's Manitoba? And she was like, no idea. Um, and then I just started becoming obsessed with these very <laughs> nice cooperative people who we treat like shit because they are nice and cooperative. <laughs> Uh, Sam, like, it all just comes down to, in 1964, one of their political parties said, we should have a flag, maybe, and the other political party was like, we don't matter enough. That's why I love Canada. <laughs> Thank we you. Have, we have time for one last question. One last question. Right Hi, I'm Leslie. Hello, Leslie. Um, now that you have your own show that you run, what do you love about being a showrunner and sort of being the boss? Um, it is terrible in its way. That's um, like, it's, it's really fun that no one's really going to yell at me if I'm late. Um, that's super fun. Um, and like, <laughs> The, f the fact that it, it really is a show that is like representative of my voice and what I think is funny. We did some very stupid or silly things on that show. Okay, no, here's the answer. The answer is 
before that just saying, when I went back to the Mindy Project to write on the Mindy Project, it was nice to be on a show where somebody else solved the problems. Where at the end of the day, I went home and Mindy and Matt figured out what was going on. That said, I, at the beginning of the season, uh, of the first season was like, I want there to be a Carmen San Diego map on the ground. I want somebody to run around on a Carmen San Diego map. And then on the second run of the show, one of our writers, Rashida Crockett, was like, um, oh, somebody had gone to a historically black college and she was like, we're doing Carmen San Diego, but with historically black colleges and universities. And I was like, exactly. <laughs> that is exactly the thing I want on my show. <laughs> And maybe nobody else thought that that was super hilarious, but to me, it was the most satisfying thing on the planet. Oh, guy Branham. Okay, you guys, you have to buy not one, but two copies of this book. It's so fantastic. Thank you guys so much for coming yeah, out. I really appreciate you. it.